Hey everybody, welcome to the Pound for Pound Leader Podcast with Mike Kai. My name is DJ Garza's Podcast Director, and on behalf of Mike Kai, I just wanna thank you for joining us on the show today. I recently had an incredible opportunity to have a discussion with a man who is a legend in the Christian world when it comes to youth ministry and reaching the next generation, and that is none other, none other than Ron Luce. Ron Luce has been in ministry for the past three decades, reaching youth in incredible, massive ways. He has been filling stadiums uh, across the nation and even the globe with the youth and seeing their hearts and their lives transformed, whether that was through Team Mania, Acquire the Fire, or the different outreaches that he's done since then. He continues to equip church leaders and pastors to help them, uh, just equip them to be able to continue to reach the next generation and really change the way we in the West do church as he's seen it over different continents and through all of the experience that he did. A Recently, he finished his doctrinal dissertation on how to really begin to equip the church to reach that next generation. And so it was an incredible interview and I'd love to share it with you today. Hey, I just wanna encourage you, if you haven't yet, make sure you subscribe to the podcast, subscribe to the YouTube channel so that you don't miss the latest interviews, discussions that Mike Kai has with the great leaders and the great uh, guests that we have every single month. And then make sure you like it, make sure you comment because that'll help us to get this valuable content in front of more people around the world. Hey, without further ado, let's check out this insightful interview with Ron Luce. Well, Dr. Ron, thank you for joining us on the Pound for Pound podcast. And uh, Pastor Mike, of course, would have loved to have been here to be uh, to be sharing this moment with you and interviewing you and having a conversation about just the amazing things you're doing. You came here, you uh, poured into our married couples, which has been awesome. We had a marriage summit seminar, and that has been great. You spoke to our staff about just reaching the youth and it wasn't even just about reaching the youth it was about just seeing churches become more healthy mm. and so thank you so much for being here today what a blessing we love pastor mike and pastor lisa and inspire church right on right on we also have uh dalen kahiapo here as well and uh thank you dalen thank you for joining us as well you have been a part of was it teen mania at the time mm -hmm. yep. when you were teen part mania. of the organization with, with dr ron and i uh, wanted to have him here as well because um just to hear your experiences and what what God did when you were part of the organization. But before we jump into that, Dr. Ron, just tell us, you know, maybe some people out there aren't totally familiar, even though you are a legend in in in, in the church world and in especially in the youth area and ministry, uh, filling up stadiums all over the world. But what is your what was your story? How did you how did you how did God grab a hold of your heart? And then how did that lead to this trajectory into into the youth? Well, I grew up in California, which of course is a neighboring state to Hawaii. And uh, and uh, <laughs> yeah. we were a good church going family. Uh, we went to every dead church in California growing up. <laughs> and my parents were divorced and remarried three different times, three mm -hmm. different people. So, um, uh, but I, so I was a raw heathen. And uh, by the time I was 15, I'd run away from my mom to go find my dad. After I found my dad, um, the first thing he says to me is, now son, the very first night, son, if you can try that marijuana, just be sure to bring it home so we can all try it together. <laughs> and I thought, what a cool dad, you know, this is great <laughs> California parenting. So I felt like, remember, I remember the good book said you're supposed to obey your parents. So uh, I, I felt obligated to bring it home. <laughs> and so I did, and me and him and my stepmom would get high. So I'm living like a heathen, party animal for a year, and a friend invites me to church. I'm like, sure, I'll, I'll go to church, God's cool. I'm cool, we'll get along fine. So you can see I was arrogant. And when, and this is a church, I'd never been to a church like this. They were just, people were crazy in this church, like singing really loud and <laughs> weeping and like, what happened to these people, you know? And then the pastor got up and spoke. And first sermon I ever heard in English, cause it was actually in normal words, you know, <laughs> right. it wasn't in like right. theology words. I'm like, why hadn't I ever heard this before? This is great news. So I'm in, give my life. I become a hardcore follower of Jesus uh, at that point, get on fire for God, go away uh, to college or Roberts University, met, met my wife there. And uh, even while I was in school at ORU, I was involved in youth ministry because mm -hmm. I figured, I don't know what else to do. God can get to me 
if he could get to me, he'd get to any kid, you right. know, uh, no, there's nobody worse than me. And so I'm and involved in youth ministry there, Youth for Christ and Campus Life. And once we graduated, um, got married and felt the Lord really calling us to go and um, uh, do everything we can to make the gospel understandable to a young generation. Right. And then challenge them to do something uh, Indiana Jones, eat your heart out. Go on a mission trip. Go change the world. Yeah. Go make a difference, you know, uh, with your life. And um, so we ended up starting conferences. We called Acquire the Fire conferences. And um, uh, over the years, God blessed us with favor, and we started traveling city after city. Ultimately, we were in 33 cities a year, wow. uh, going to arenas and stadiums uh, week after week after week, 33 times a year. Wow. And over the years, saw you know, millions of young people come to the events and we don't even know how many uh, came come, came to Christ. I mean, thousands every weekend would surrender their life. And it wasn't a bunch of hype and hoopla. A lot of people think, well, kids, that's just emotionalism. We were kind of the anti-emotionalism. Mm -hmm. We're like, we don't, mm -hmm. we don't want to manipulate. We right. want people to make a great decision. And sometimes that affects your emotions, but it doesn't mean it's emotionalism. Yeah. And uh, tried to really... Um, honor their attention span. If they're gonna be there for 27 hours, it's Friday night, all these Saturdays, Saturday night. We wanna leverage every hour that we could wow. for great communication of scripture, but in ways that are unforgettable. So it's not just singing and preaching. There's always um, uh, drama and video mm -hmm. and comedy mm -hmm. and uh, interrupting me every five or six or seven minutes. Yeah. It, my sermons and messages all woven together like a tapestry of creativity. Sometimes it's a full length drama. Yeah. We, were, we would always do worship, um, like this, we were doing worship before worship was cool because right. we just wanted to get people in the presence of yeah. God. And it's so interesting because, you know, we would have young people come from every denomination you could think of and they get in the presence of God and they're like, oh my gosh, they feel like they're about to get raptured because yeah. they never had it before. Yeah. You know, they've mm -hmm. just been kind of in traditional worship and all of a sudden they sense the presence. We're just kind of hyper coaching them during worship services, like, okay, now just surrender your heart. Okay, now sing these words from your heart. Yeah. You know, close your eyes and sing it as a prayer. Like just coaching them along. And they're like, wow, this is way better than just singing a song. Yeah. So, um, and just ultimately pray for an encounter with the Lord. And yeah. so, uh, so Dalen was a part of the creative team for many years, where helping to create those moments in Acquire the Fire events, where yeah. that the video clips and the nuances, and because we were we we're always trying to think like, um, like back when Disney had a good name. Yeah. You know, you go to Disneyland or Disney World and you think mm -hmm. every everything you look at had a purpose. Yeah. Little bush mm -hmm. was shaped mm -hmm. like this. And like, so we wanted everything from yeah. the moment you walked in to have a purpose that that in terms of like a, it would remind you of a scripture or right. a principle, something from the Bible and try to make, in, in the good sense of the word, eye candy, that's unforgettable. Right. So they may not remember my five points, but they'll remember that video clip or yeah. this funny thing. And they'll remember the verse from the scripture that you know changed their lives. So. Oh, that's so awesome. And so Dalen, when you came in, how did you get introduced to the ministry? Um, well, that's a crazy story in and of itself. And um, it started out with, um, uh, well, obviously we're in Hawaii. Team Mania was not in Hawaii. They do these events all over the place. And I had a friend who went and visited friends in the mainland in Maryland. Actually, you know, uh, Daniel, Pastor Daniel Kikawa. Yeah. So his daughter, um, nothing to do with Teen Mania, nothing to do with Acquire the Fire. And um, she goes out and visits relatives in the mainland, somehow gets a hold of a brochure, somehow brings it back with her to Hawaii and mm -hmm. somehow ends up in my house with the brochure. <laughs> and what she had no skin in the game with Teen Mania didn't really know who they were, was not telling me to go do anything with Team Mania. She just happened to have this thing and happened to leave it at my house. Yeah. Um, so I pick it up a couple days later and I am reading it and I didn't have like a strong, we were living out in Laie on the beach. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't have like a strong cloud of Christian Christianity around me. So I just was reading this thing. I was like, oh, you know, this it talks about the Great Commission and his brochure just was in your face about, you know, the idea I got was that it's not a great suggestion. It's like a great commission. Like if you are, this is what we're called to do, mm -hmm. go and preach the gospel. I'm like, well, I guess this is what I got to do. Right. You know, no 14 years old, <laughs> like, oh, you know, A plus B must yeah. equal C. So here we go. And nice. I went to El Salvador, started going on missions. Wow. And um, that was the beginning of, 
a crucial step in my life that has led to where I am today. And it led to me going to their year long internship that a year long internship there. And then, uh, just one thing led to another eventually was on staff with them. And, um, yeah, that's how I ended up at the, um, working at teen mania for yeah. many years, uh, as a result of somebody happening to bring home a brochure, 5,000 miles wow. across the sea. Mm-hmm. And that's about wow. it. Share with me one, um, maybe just how, how does how is that whole experience working in that organization with Dr. Ron? How has that impacted your life? Um, it has. I would not be the person I am today if not for what I went through with Teen Mania, Acquire the Fire, Leadership Twenty Twenty, their their program back then. Mm-hmm. Um, I was so a lot has been said about you know. A bubble, you know. Oh, you're in a bubble, or, or I've, heard, I've heard that said about being in the church. Like, yeah. oh, you're in the bubble. That's not the real world, or whatever. And for me, that bubble was was vital. It was necessary. It was, you know, I, I it could either be, um, you know, it could have either been like a hot springs, or it's yeah. lukewarm and comfortable, and anyone can come dip your toe in, or it could be a crucible where you just get put in the flames. Yeah, and it's for a purpose, a fiery purpose. And that's what it was for me. The bubble was a crucible and it burned stuff. It hurt a lot of times, yeah. but all you, you know, in a very real way, all, you know, everything comes to the surface and you deal with stuff. And um, I'm thankful for that time. That was a bubble. I had great leaders that modeled it for me that, you know, it, the bubble eliminated distractions for me. And I needed that at that point in my life. I was 17 years old. I had no idea. I was a jellyfish before I walked in there. I had no form, no function to my life. I had no idea who I was in Christ or what really I was going to, who I was or who I was going to be. And what that did was that place, it eliminated a lot of the distractions. You weren't able to date. So I I didn't care if this girl liked me or not because that that option was not there. So you're purely focused on just pursuing God, building character, radically um, identifying issues in your life and then systematically targeting them and working on them. Like this is my first experience of active Christianity versus passive up mm. to that, my, up to that point in my life, I was a passive mm. Christian. I was a passive Christian and a passive person in general. Like yeah. my structure was provided by my surroundings and team Mania was the first time in my life where I learned principles, figured out how to incorporate them into my life through great leadership. And then also while I was there, leadership, you know, really hammering it into us that this is a race. It's a, it's a marathon of your entire life. Yeah. You're only on the first turn of a long, you know, there's a lot coming. We're going, you yeah. want to win the prize at the end. And so pondering my life from that eternal viewpoint and like everything changed yeah. from there. I am the man who I am now. I'm the husband I am now from watching what a godly man does as a husband. I didn't have, I mean, I love my dad now. He's come a long way, but we had a rough time yeah. growing up. And um, and I got to see modeled in very real fashion what a man of God does yeah. after working 48 hours straight, goes home and serves his wife. You know, I get to see what a father does. Yeah. I get to see real fatherhood modeled for me 24 seven day in and day out. And yeah, I, I would not be who I am today without, um, without Teen Mania, awesome. you know, all of it. Wow. We had a lot of good leaders, a lot of good staff that mm-hmm. really poured into guys like Dalen and all of our yeah. hundreds of interns that were there World at the same class time. staff. Yeah. So you had how many staff and how many interns? I know, I remember hearing like, who was that? Well, over the years, one? you know, well, at, at, at one point we had 200 staff yeah. and at, at, at one point we had 900 interns wow. all at the same time oh, on the campus. Goodness. So it was a, yeah. uh, quite a uh, metropolis in the middle of nowhere. It was a small city. Yeah. <laughs> it had its own sewer system. And <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the one of the stigmas like youth have, whether it's from junior high to high school, is that they kind of trying to buck responsibility. They're, you know, they just want to, you know, relax, do their own thing, just, you know, s- stare at their screens, whatever. How is it that you're able to get so many young people to kind of step into leadership in this way? Well, you know, it's it's the it's if you if you expect a little you get little, mm-hmm. but if you when you deliver an expectation like you you have this in you you can rise to it, rise to the challenge then then they would and so one of the things 
um, first of all, I think that's how Jesus treated his disciples, even before they were disciples. You know, he was like, come on, step up. You're going to be fishers of men, you know, like this kind of thing, you know? And so that is always the kind of Christianity that we try to present. Like, you know, this is the thing that demands your all. It's worth your all. Right. Give your all to Christ. So then when young people would come to, for a year to our internship, it was a whole year of that, like mm -hmm. step up, I mean, really step up. Yeah. It doesn't matter. You're 17, 18, 19, step up and be the leaders of your generation. And then we would give them responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, different parts of the ministry where like, people would come to the campus like, this whole place is run by teenagers. Imagine <laughs> you have 200 staff, but 900 teenagers. Yeah. You're like, they're doing the stuff of changing a generation. You know, they're making the videos. Yeah. They're, you know, we're, we're doing stadiums and arenas every weekend, 5,000, 10,000. Yeah. And the young people themselves are actually getting the people to those events. They're oh. calling, they're mailing mm -hmm. stuff, they're call, they're encouraging, they're praying for youth pastors all over the nation. And the youth pastor is like about ready to quit. He's like 35 years old. And here's a 17, 18 year old praying, come on, Jesus name, praying for me. Yeah. I'm gonna stay in ministry because of you. They're yeah. prayed for by a young person. So yeah. it was really uh, four teens by teens. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. So, um, you know, you, you shared with us the staff that you went and got your doctorate in strategic foresight, which just sounds like the coolest like degree yeah. that you can ever get, right? <laughs> and uh, Telling the future. Yeah, like exactly. <laughs> Being able to predict the future and just looking at trends in a sense. Um, what, where do you see, what is the state of the church now? What do the trends look like for, um, I guess, maybe the church here in the United States? Well, so this is the alarming thing. You know, trends are things, they teach you in strategic foresight to, to look at events and see where are their trends. And a lot of times, when you once you point out a trend, you go, people go, oh yeah. It's like you notice it, but it's sort of like connecting the dots to mm. see, it's not just this event and this study and this thing, but there's actually a trend here. And by understanding the trends, then you can lean into them and go, okay, let's do something about it. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is many times the trends are alarming and we don't wanna believe them. You know, right. we, think, we would like to think, oh, that's an anomaly or that's a one-off or whatever. So I went in to study strategic foresight going, okay, what are the biggest trends that are impacting the church right now? And what can we do about it? And and what will impact the church five years and 10 years and 20 years from now? Because it's sort of like youth ministry on the other end, because whatever those trends are, are gonna most affect the younger generation mm, right. here in Hawaii right. or all over America or the world. So one of the, the the biggest trends we found is um, well, the knowledge revolution, which is essentially they, they document how long does it take for knowledge to double? It used to take 100 years. Everything we know about everything to double in 50 years, then 10 years. Now, everything we know about everything in the world doubles every 12 months, except for medical wow. information. It doubles every 80 days. Wow. wow. And so when you, when you think about, so knowledge is growing. Scripture talks about knowledge increasing in the yeah. end times, but it's not just increasing, it's being digitized, sucked into big data, turned into X's and O's, analyzed by AI, and now it's created a whole new, what they call knowledge-based economy or digital economy. Mm -hmm. So almost every industry is being touched by this, like even if you're in the oil industry or you're in this industry, in that industry, um, everything is being changed. So for example, you would think, Hyatt or Marriott, they're hotels for crying out loud. How could they be touched by it? Well, right. Airbnb comes along, they don't own one room, but they, they do this. They've got half a million rooms they can rent just right. like that. Yeah. Hyatt, Marriott doesn't have a half a million rooms. They got like 50,000 rooms. And, but Airbnb doesn't own one thing. So it's changed a whole economy and really it's a whole different way of thinking. Mm -hmm. Things have become exponential as a result. They call them exponential companies. They go from zero to a billion dollar company yeah. in a year or less. Yeah. Um, so many of them and, and investors are looking for those. And so it's a lot of the Fortune 100 or 500 companies are being outdated, being outgrown, are going to become obsolete if they're not already, because they don't even know how to think like that. Mm. And of course, I'm thinking, how does that impact the church? Because the digital mm. knowledge-based economy is affecting kids, social media, what to watch, how many, you know, how many hours a day, all this kind of stuff. Our smartphones are making a generation dumber. Mm -hmm. I mean, literally, mm -hmm. they don't memorize things because Siri right. knows everything. Mm -hmm. So, what are these social impacts uh, from that? Things like all kinds of data says that more the more you're online, the more likely you are to be depressed. Wow. So, what does that say about everybody that we ever minister to? Yeah, adults and young people, right? Because yeah. and and, and all, all the 
the the things that we know in terms of the the widespread pornography and mm -hmm. the, uh, you know virtual reality and gaming and uh, living in false realities and I've got my avatar right. and people are getting addicted to these games and avatar mm -hmm. and like living this world with all the endorphins they get and so understanding that is widespread can inform how we think about ministry yeah it mm -hmm. doesn't mean we have to do everything online all of a sudden it doesn't mean there's not w any one single implication, but it does mean we need to keep our eye on that ball because yeah. it's mm -hmm. affecting the whole world. Another one of the biggest trends that we noticed is what we call the grain of the church or the aging of the church. Mm -hmm. All over the world, we see this trend in America, but but everywhere that the church has been established for a while, it's getting older and older and older. And so in a place like Korea, they've shut down 10,000 churches in the last 10 years because everybody, in those churches got old and died and there was no one left. Wow. Wow. And so it's a picture of what's happening. Well, we, we've had ineffective uh, youth ministry in America, despite what we tried to do, doing all these events, seeing millions of young people, yeah. a lot of other people, with youth pastors and youth ministries and things, we keep losing more and more of each generation. Millennials, 49% say they're Christian. Gen Xers say more than that say they're Christian, but the Gen Z's 38%. Mm -hmm. So. We're doing lots of stuff, but we're reaching less and less percentage-wise. Mm -hmm. And as a result, um, probably of this 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 trend, the grain of the church, the thing that kind of haunts me, the big kind of backdrop as I think about it is, as a result of the aging of the church, according to all the current trends, what Pew Research says, by 2050, there'll be more Muslims in the world than Christians. Mm -hmm. So that's never happened before. Right mm. now, in spite of all the revivals, best-selling books, internet ministries, all the albums and yeah. CDs and music, that's what's happening. And so, I'm not a doomsdayer, but I am saying we need to look at the data and and let it instead of like showing the the panorama. Oh, look at the crowd we had, you know, and like oh revivals. We keep hearing that kind of stuff. Yeah. But when you look at the data, the yeah. data doesn't say that. Mm -hmm. The data is saying we better pray more. Right. And then we better employ some strategies. Yeah. That mm -hmm. um and so um anyways, I was uh we if you look at only the trends, you can be a little discouraged. Sure. Um but I like to think about how the you know the guys that went into the promised land, the 12 spies mm -hmm. And 10 came back, oh no, we're all gonna die. Right. But Joshua and Caleb looked at the giants and said, well, they're big, they're there, but our God's bigger. It's a land flowing in milk and honey yeah. and we can take them you know, with yeah. our God. And so let's look at the data. Let's not play pretend, oh no, it's just fine. It's not fine, Yeah. but our God's still bigger. Right, right. And um, so part of the good news that I shared with with your team in the master class the other day is that, um, uh, that in spite of these data, we found some churches, we identified some in Asia and then in Africa and South America that are defying the odds yeah. and they're reaching and discipling uh, those most likely to come to Christ, which turns out are the young generation. Yeah. They're most likely to come. They're re in a, a, at a level that I've never seen in America, I've never seen anywhere. And they're reaching and discipling and reaching and discipling and reaching and discipling. So I went and studied these churches, went to all of them, got under the hood, poked around. What are you guys doing? How yeah. are you doing it? How are you training your leaders? And then put all that into my doctoral dissertation, into the master class to help churches learn instead of being hopeless, like, wow, we don't know what to do. I keep seeing all these podcasts and different, you know, um, thing, well, how to reach Generation Z. Yeah. Listen, mm -hmm. this is not like splitting the atom. It's not hard. Right. Mm -hmm. People are already doing it. Yeah. And, and and so I just curated the ideas and said, okay, it's we can do this thing, but we've just got to get our mind around it and learn from each other. Yeah. Not, not be, you know, learn best practices. Every industry learns best practices. The church, somehow we don't like to do that. We think, well, God's just gonna speak to me. I'm gonna go to the mountain, be like Mount Sinai and Moses, he'll give me a strategy. Or or our strategy is just pray. Mm -hmm. Pray for a Jesus movement. Well, that's important, but prayer's not a strategy. Prayer needs to be baked into everything we're right. doing, right? Mm -hmm. And let's yeah. find out the smart things, the wise things to do that we know are working and then pray for a, um, how do we personalize those best practices for, for our church or our city or our culture? Right. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, um, in the masterclass, so that that age, that age group, I think is around thirteen to nineteen, but I think it was around the th age thirteen. You called it um, the branding age. Can you unpack that a little bit? Well, there's been a lot of data and studies uh, around. Uh, marketers have done this. Um, what? When do people get attached to a brand? And so, uh, and thirteen is the branding age. They've identified it maybe. 
15 years ago that, mm -hmm. for example, if you can get a kid to love your chips when he's 13, he'll probably buy them his whole life mm -hmm. or her whole life or their, your shoes. They get it, you know, they're branded to Starbucks or to Nike or whatever they'll buy. Yeah. So branders go after the 13 year old window because they stand to make billions upon billions of dollars over the course of their whole life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if they try to get them later, well, they've already been branded to Nike or to Lay's mm -hmm. or something like that. Yeah. And it's very similar with the gospel where, so uh, International Bible Society says it's four, four to 14 years old, 83% of people come to Christ. There's some studies say all the way up to 90% of people come to Christ wow. before they're 20 years old. Mm -hmm. So something wow. happens, we humans, we think we're smarter than everybody by the time we're 20. We don't want to change our mind. Right. And it's like we've been branded by a lifestyle, mm. you know, uh, values from Hollywood or YouTube or wherever we're getting them from. And we're like, we're, we're good. Leave us alone. Don't you, you can't tell me anything. 13 years old. And so if 13 to 19 is the window, every spot in the world, uh, the sweet spot's a little bit different in that window, okay? Right. So in Japan, it's more like 18 and 19. They physically can't get to them culturally before they're 18 when they're still in their home, but when they get to university, they're malleable, hmm. they can get to them. They're, they're thinking of new uh, systems of yeah. thinking and, and philosophies mm -hmm. and all that. Mm -hmm. However, in most places that are um, uh, westernized, you can get to 13 year olds yeah. if, if you can, because right. they're not, they're sort of in that stage, like, I don't know what I am, I'm not a kid, yeah. but I'm not an adult, what am I? And if we're not mm -hmm. careful, we'll let Instagram define it or TikTok define it for them, right? Yeah. And so our our opportunity, so here's the kid, he's 13, he's like, who's, they're look, desperately looking for acceptance. Is it the cool kids? Is it the jocks? Is it this music? Is it that music? Is it, the, who's gonna accept me? Right. Is it the LGBTQ? Like, who's gonna accept me into yeah. their group? They're, and most of the time, the church is running right by them. Let's go reach the cool kids, hmm. you know, the football players or whatever, and then they'll reach everybody else. And it hasn't worked for 40 years. <laughs> I don't know why we think it might work <laughs> over the next decade. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the branders are going after them, the drug dealers yeah. are going after them, the sex traffickers are going after them, the cool kids are going after them, everybody else is going after the 13 year olds. And so there's a great opportunity to reach them while they're open and uh, with, uh, you know, to, to find somebody that's gonna really make them, uh, you know, feel like they're an important part of this group. And, yeah. uh, and so churches that are doing that are seeing great fruit because they reach them when they're most soft and they put them into a, a pipeline. We kind of call it, use the metaphor, a pipeline of discipleship. Yeah. So they come in the pipeline at 13 mm. and they think about what do they want them to look like at 20 or 21 or 25, some, and they reverse engineer it. So yeah. this is what we want them to look like as a young adult. What would we, what the, would they have to do at 13 and then 14 and then 15? Kind of just like a school system, you scope and sequence it all the way through. Yeah. And so it's not an accident. How long have we known in America? Those kids, they just go off to college. They don't come back. It's a, They don't come back to mm -hmm. church. Well, yeah. you, that's not splitting the atom. We can figure that out, yeah. especially if we're yeah. smart and capture them while they're young, put them in a pipeline. So part of their growth process, they're learning how to multiply, learning yeah. how to be a leader, learning how to yeah. disciple others. Yeah. So if you've been teaching somebody for six or seven years, by the time you're 20 or 21, your roots are so deep, you're not going anywhere except stronger in the Lord. Yeah, wow, that's that's incredible. You know, um, one of the things we see is just these different generations. And like you said, there's so much changing, knowledge is doubling so quickly. And you have these generations from, Gen X, which I think that's what I'm, Gen X, then you have millennials, then you have a uh, Gen Z. And I think the next one I heard was like alpha or something. Yep. Like, that'd be my kids, I guess. But um, is there, I mean, do you engage those different generations differently? Have you seen that over the course of time or is it the same things that they're going through? Well, this is interesting. So every generation has its own peculiar peculiarities, you know, things that maybe they're more ambitious. And there's there's all kinds of theories of cycles of generation. This generation and the, is like this and is ambitious. And this one's more like this. And this one's mm -hmm. more, you know, and, and those truisms are there. However, stages of life seem to stay consistent. Hmm. So at mm -hmm. 13, people go through this. At yeah. 18, they go through this. At 21, they go through oh, this. Yeah. It might be yeah. flavored a little bit different. And so people are, it, um, even sociologists slash Christians are like, well, what is it about Gen Z that will reach them? Well, if they're 13, it's the same thing that will reach mm -hmm. a Gen X when they yeah. were 13 right. or a baby boomer when they were 13 because they're all at that stage like, does anybody care about me? Mm. What, what, am I gonna, what am I gonna be bonded to? What am I gonna be known for? What is my thing? What group will mm -hmm. I be a part of? They're desperately wanting that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, you know, 
I was reading somewhere, and I and I don't know if this research is outdated already. It's like, but I, I believe it was last year. They're saying the median church attendance is like sixty five people, right? So half the churches in America are sixty five, or so, I mean, this is number of people attending, um, or smaller. And uh, let's say you've got these churches. They're like, okay, we want to do this. We want to we want to begin to reach the youth. We we don't even have a youth program. What kind of advice would you give them to get them started to be making the kind of impact that that they could make? Well, first of all, every church and every pastor should know there's hope because it seems like to this point it's been that thing that is it's um it's impossible to discover how to do this because what what's happened is we all we know to do is hire a youth guy, hire a youth pastor, and he's a cool guy with a little tattoo, plays the guitar, <laughs> you know? and then he's gone in a few years and they hire another guy. And they hire another guy, and because they don't know what else to do, right. pastors a lot of times feel uh, inept in regarding young people. Like I'm not cool, I'm not relatable. A lot of us have this problem, but you know, um, these churches that I found that are reaching and discipling, the pastor's not cool. He's not trying to be a teenager. Right. You know, he's not trying to be. He's he's actually the strategist. It just like the people that run viacom that own mtv and mtv2 and nickelodeon mm -hmm. they're not trying to be young and cool they're the strategists trying to get young eyeballs in front of their media mm -hmm. and so we need pastors it doesn't matter if you have 100 people or 65 people or whatever in your church you're the strategist going okay how do we get the gospel in front of the younger generation and 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 keep asking the mm -hmm. question strategy is the how you do it and i think what happens is the church has gotten so frustrated like I have, I don't know how, and I keep asking. I stop asking how. Mm -hmm. Well, MTV didn't stop asking how. Nickelodeon start, didn't start. The drug dealers don't stop asking how. Right. We got to keep asking mm -hmm. how, how, how do we get to the hmm. kids, the gospel to the kids in our own community? And mm -hmm. and so if you don't really have a youth program, you know we, we have this model that says unless we can afford a youth pastor, we can't really have a pro program. That's wrong. First of all, pastors, um, you can start small. Just go and have a coffee or a Coke with a kid like once a month and ask them, what's it like to be a kid right now? A 13 or a 15 mm. year old. Like, mm. what? let me see through your eyes. Um, what do you listen to? Yeah. What do you worry about? What do your friends talk about? What YouTubes are uh, popular? And um, some will call it reverse mentoring. Like, let them bring you into their perception of the That's world. Good. Yeah. So what will happen, first of all, Pastor, if you do that, You'll start loving them and you'll have empathy for them. You'll pray for them better. And then ask your leadership team to do the same. Hmm. You know, people that are, and even if you don't have a program, if it starts, you don't start with the program, start with a heart that really, truly empathizes. Uh, you care, you're praying for them. And then you can start researching best practices, you know, with our tools or other tools like, okay, now we have a heart for them. What can we do? Please note, um, when you're thinking about what to do, mm -hmm. um, there's there's a lot of stuff being done. Like I got an app for this. I got an app for that. I got you think and and not everything is the highest rate of return. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, right. entrepreneurs yeah. always think about uh, ROI, rate of, rate of uh, return on investment. Like how much fruit am I getting that? And so yeah. when you're looking at how to after you have a heart for them, think about what's the best way to spend that money, that time, the sweat, the volunteer hours, so you get the biggest bang for the for the buck or for the time, you know, in terms of mm -hmm. how many people are coming to Christ, how are we discipling them, and really think deeply about what's the end game. Yeah. So one of the, the things we found with these exponential churches is they think deeply, okay, what do we want them to look like at 20? And how are we gonna make everything we're doing make that happen? Mm -hmm. And then we measure it along the way and we re reverse engineer it. And so don't just do stuff, have a real clear picture of what you want them to look like and then reverse engineer it. And, and there's tools out there to help you do that. We've developed, other people have de developed them so that you don't have to kind of figure it all out by yourself, but it does, you do have to get a heart for young people yourself. By, right. And I would encourage you, talk to them yourself and listen to them, and begin to pray for them. That's mm -hmm. so good. That's so good. I, I wanna shift a little bit because you are an incredible leader and, and even looking back and you're mentioning like 33 cities in a year and, uh, I know whether people are listening or watching this are in ministry or in the marketplace. They're probably thinking, how did you even like navigate all of that? How did you not go just crazy? How did you maintain um, your marriage and still uh, pour into your kids? Because even Dalen, you said you you saw you saw this as mm -hmm. crazy as things were, as busy as things were. How are you able to just run at that sustainable pace doing all that you're doing? Um, being married and having kids? Well, 
great wife <laughs> and uh, a lot of a great team around me. Mm -hmm. So as as the ministry kept growing and growing, we would add staff, intern, uh, interns would grow. Um, you have to have great leaders all around you. So, you know, I had a leadership team that would help me run the whole organization. Literally, I would show up to a city, two or three semi trucks with our gear showed up in advance. The team set everything up. There was a team of interns on the road going from city to city. So, so in some cities, um, some weekends, we ran out of weekends. So we'd have to do two events on the same weekend in different cities. So I'd go to Friday on one and Saturday in the other. And we still had sessions with other speakers, um, mirror, mirror events kind of thing. Yeah. And But what we tried to do personally, you, to your question, is have a personal rhythm. That is, uh, we said Sabbath days. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm I'm preaching my guts out all day on Friday and Saturday. Um, so I wouldn't even speak in a church on Sunday. I'd fly home Sunday morning to be with my family. Mm -hmm. Monday would be our Sabbath day. We'd take it off because we homeschooled our kids. I say we, I mean Katie, my wife did. <laughs> and um, but that would be our Sabbath day with our family. Mm -hmm. So we would always make sure we had mm -hmm. family time. Um, I would take Thursdays as a preparation day, like always praying, so I could be focused on the weekend. I would give my very best to these uh, young people. And then Tuesdays and Wednesdays when I would go into the ministry and like manage things and mm -hmm. whatever. And uh, so we try to always have that rhythm. I would take uh, each weekend, one of my kids would come with me. Katie wouldn't let them come with me before they were uh, one. But as soon as I turned one, I could take them with me. Mm -hmm. And so I was Mr. Mom on the road. Right? <laughs> yeah. I had a diaper bag, yeah. I had a stroller. Yeah. And um, during my preaching sessions, you know, somebody would be watching the kids right after the word, I'd pick them up and I'd try to, um, during the weekends, sneak away and we'd go to a, like a children's museum or something fun for the kids, like during, you know, lunchtime or something like that. Uh, once a month, Katie would come with me because uh, we, we felt like this. I have a total heart for the family. Mm -hmm. She has a total heart for the ministry, but we had different roles. So mm. her role most of the time is managing it, uh, the, the household and, the, and pouring into the kids and homeschooling. I'm spending the bulk of my time in the ministry, but we both love both. Right. But we're just dividing and conquering. But I still stay involved at home. She still stays involved in the ministry by traveling once a month. Mm -hmm. And so we just felt like we weren't going to be any good for the ministry if our marriage was frazzled or if our personal lives are frazzled. Mm -hmm. So let's develop a rhythm. No matter how busy we would get, we kept that same kind of rhythm. Wow. Yeah, that's good. I think it takes take some discipline, especially in these days when you can just be pulled yeah. to do all kinds of things. And, and even back then, like this, actually before we even had cell phones, right? But still the phone's ringing off the hook at night, mm -hmm. you know? And so we would just, as soon as I would get home, we'd turn the thing and we couldn't even hear the answering machine anymore. Yeah, Like mm -hmm. I'm not answering calls, mm -hmm. this is my family time kind of thing. So good, so good. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. And we probably could spend so much time just unpacking everything you unpacked for us at mm. the masterclass. Um, and speaking of that, how how can people find more about what you're doing? And and even churches are like, we we wanna we wanna get more equipped in reaching the youth. Um, what kind of resources or where can they find you? Sure. If you just go to generationnext.me.me, mm -hmm. uh, you can get you see everything that's going on there. Or if you want more information on the masterclass, you can just go to exponentialpastor.com. And uh, you can see videos up there for free and see everything, that, you know, kind of the overview, all the whole curriculum of the masterclass is exponentialpastor.com. Awesome. We'll have that on the site as well as the show notes. And I just want to say thank you again for being a part of this podcast, this interview, but also, again, for pouring into our people. And uh, I know there's a lot of changes and shifts we're going to make because our, 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 we're seeing that the necessity of reaching the youth is so important. Amen. Thank you, Dalen, for also thank joining you. us. Thank, thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Dean. Uh, DJ and um, uh, uh, CJ and and Dalen and just what a pleasure it is to be in Hawaii. <laughs> and I just want to tell everybody if you're not in Hawaii, um, you know a bad day in Hawaii is not a place to have a bad day. <laughs> <laughs> it is beautiful. Here, right. so. Awesome. No complaints. No complaints. <laughs> <laughs> we'll check out those resources, everybody, and uh, we'll see you again on the Pound for Pound podcast. God bless. Wow, how awesome was that? The insight, the wisdom, the research, just everything that Ron Luce brought today, I think was not only encouraging, but I think gave us just a better understanding of how we can move forward in ministry, but just to see the hearts of the next generation 
transformed and changed. And so if you want to find out more about him, check out generationnext.me or exponentialpastor.com and you can get more information. Check out Ron Luce. For other great resources, make sure you visit mikekai.tv. You can get Pastor Mike's books as well as Pastor Lisa's books, whether that's uh, the pound for pound leadership principle, the pound for pound principle, or maybe it's plateaus, or maybe it's his latest book, which is one of my favorites. That doesn't just happen, how excellence accelerates everything. Make sure you pick that up. There's also a masterclass there as well. And also follow him on Instagram so you can find out what's going on in his world and also some other great teachings that you can access as well. Thank you again for joining us on the Pound for Pound Leader Podcast. We'll see you next time. Aloha. Thank you.